Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest because he has a model that really uh, I find very intriguing. I know Scott finds very intriguing as well. But that being said, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd. ScottTodd.net. LandMoto.com. Most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist, and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash The Land Geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm excited. I'm excited to, to soak in the wisdom, the knowledge. This is always, uh, uh, when, whenever we, we hear about like this type of an investment, I kind of get shiny object syndrome and I wonder like, should I be talking to Brad? I mean, our guest, should I be talking to our guest and not you, Mark? I don't know. We'll have to see. Pro- I don't know. Let's see. I'm, I'm excited to, to just let it all go and maybe, you know, be in the Brad Smotherman camp. If you don't know who Brad Smotherman is, Brad Smotherman is our guest from bradsmotherman.com. He is a professional house flipper, but the way that he sells the houses is very unique, very special, and actually kind of cool. So Brad Smotherman, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Doing very well, Mark. Appreciate you guys having me on. So Brad, let's rewind the tape a bit. And before you became a professional investor, what were you doing? Well, I got into real estate when I was 17. Uh, I decided to get my real estate license and I sold real estate through college. Well, College ended right at in 08, and I thought, well, gosh, this is a terrible real estate market. Let me use this accounting degree that I worked on for four years, and that lasted for about 30 days. So I went into tax. I decided pretty quickly, like, I can't do this type of work, uh, the desk environment. I'm an entrepreneur at heart and all this, and so I went back into selling real estate. Well, guys, it was really pretty bad timing. You know, 2008, fall of 2008 was not the best time to be jumping back into a real estate sales career, but we made ends meet. And the beginning of 2010, I started doing the investing side. So I retired my license, started buying houses, selling houses, mostly with owner financing. And, uh, you know, just been rocking and rolling ever since. Okay, great. So if you wouldn't mind, walk us through your model and why it's unique from the typical house flipper. Sure. So it's kind of funny. The evolution of my business really started as uh, buying with equity and selling with owner financing because I was able to do that in a way that, that needed very little money. Well, I didn't have any money, so I had to find a way that was not traditional. And I looked at wholesaling and different things. And so uh, I started off creating wrap notes. Then I built up some cash and I thought, well, this is what you do when you get some cash. You start doing these HGTV style rehabs and Joanna Gaines style and these gut reframes and all this. And I did that for a couple of years. And I, I realized pretty quickly, like there's really no money in the fixing. The real money's in the financing in my opinion. So I uh, switched the model back, started doing more and more owner finance. The, one of the biggest mistakes I've made the past five years is the market was so great, I retailed out of too much and I should have kept more in note. So right now we're doing probably 70% of our businesses. We're taking the profit, putting it into note, taking, instead of taking the house retail, like a, a, a fix and flip flipper would, or instead of wholesaling the house, like wholesalers do, we're getting the property under contract and then we're selling with owner financing. We're creating all these wrap notes. Okay. So that's a lot to unpack. So let's, let's unpack the first part, which is you buying a house with equity. So what does that mean? Yeah. So um, we've bought, I guess we bought two yesterday. Um, We bought a house for $50,000. Uh, that's a cash offer at 50K and we'll owner finance that one for probably 150 with 20K down. So I'll, I'll have net $30,000 cash in a $130,000 note that is financed somewhere around, you know, seven to 8% on a 30 year note. Okay. Uh, the other transaction was actually, we bought it subject to, which means that the, the lien, the mortgage in this case that was in place in our seller's name remains in place after closing. Okay. So this, uh, lady, really nice lady. She was uh, about six months behind on her mortgage. And so we gave her $15,000 cash to take over $115,000 loan at 4%. And then we'll sell that property at 7.9% at 200. So, I mean, that that's kind of, 
and and I, I hate to like throw out the numbers because I know it's confusing for some people, but um, you know, that's kind of like an average sort of deal for us. Right. So your, your passive income then is what on a typical note deal? Yeah. So, you know, notes obviously are a promise to pay. So, you know, a lot of people kind of get this somewhat confused with like lease purchasing or land contracts. We, we don't want to do that. We do real owner financing where the buyer gets the deed at closing. Um, but an average cash flow for us with I don't know exactly. I used to really keep up with it. Um, I'd say a range would be from two fifty to eight hundred dollars a month, and somewhere in the middle there, four or five hundred dollars a month would be an average. Right, but but essentially though, the way that you have it structured is that that person living in that house owns that house. They're taking care of that house, so it's not like you're a landlord, correct? That's right. So the reason that we like notes, there are, there's a lot of reasons, but t- namely two is we get out of vacancy and we get out of repair. So there's no tenants and toilets. We have an owner. If their HVAC goes out, then they're calling the HVAC man or woman. They're not calling us as the bank in in this kind of position. So um, we are able to scale and and have a lot more notes and manage notes in-house a lot easier than we could rentals all over the place. Scott Todd, why doesn't everyone do this? Why would the HGTV people go into fix and flipping if they could just do notes this is so much simpler i i don't think that they read that line in uh, rich dad poor dad where he says uh be the bank not the banker like that that is of that whole book rich dad poor dad that is like the one line i remember like like anything be the bank not the banker i, I don't know man like i think that that people think that the note side is is uh boring they, they just don't even think about it. they they see what's on hgtv and then they go execute or they try to. And the reality is, is like, he's doing the same thing that we're doing with our notes, right? Like we're, we're selling it on owner financing and uh, reaping the yield. And that's where the money is. The money is not in the, the, the flipping of, of anything. I don't know. I want to be the bank. I want to be the bank. I mean, Brad, I, I, I love your model. It's very similar to our model. What I'd like to know is what sucks about it. Why isn't everyone doing it? If I go to a RIA meeting, and there's 100 people in the room, 99 of them are flippers, landlords, or wholesalers. Why aren't they the bank? Why aren't they no people? Well, I think that there's a few reasons for that. Number one, I think that the big push for newer investors has been wholesaling the past decade. And, and there's various people that, and it's not a terrible model. I, I don't think that there's a, a bad way to do a great deal, but I do think that there's better way than others to do a great deal. And so um, I'm not disparaging against wholesalers, but I don't like the wholesaling model because uh, if you think about it, if someone is willing to sell to you at 60 cents on the dollar, then they're probably willing to finance you if you know how to ask for it. And you understand deal structure to the context that you need to create financing. And so I think that that's one thing is that most of the information out there uh, is, is the wholesale and the fix and flip model. I think secondly, that people have the, um, the idea that you have to have a lot of cash to get into the note business. And that's not exactly true. Uh, If you know how to negotiate and deal structure, you can create equity instead of cash and then sell with owner financing. Um, And I think that uh, also a part of this is that, that people don't understand that those eight or 10 pieces of paper, that's a note and deed of trust or note and mortgage is real. It doesn't feel real because you don't own anything that you can really go and look at besides your file cabinet. Right. And so I think for that reason, it, it kind of scares people away. So I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Okay. So like, can, can you walk me through like this deal? Like the, the one that you did yesterday, you said you, you bought it for 50, somebody that's lined up to, to put $20,000 down or, or better yet. I don't know if you do or not, but you, you're, you think theoretically you're going to get $20,000 on the deal down. Correct. So with 30 in, in the bank or into the deal, mm-hmm. you're going to sell for 150 finance, you know, 130 in that case. All right. This this house, the reason that you're getting it with with that discount, I mean, there's obviously some repairs that need to be done, right? Like it, this house is not like turnkey ready to go, is it? Well, it's rentable. I wouldn't say that it's like uh, it's not updated. You know, it needs updates, so okay. it has you know the the knotty pine walls and it's a brick 1960s ranch. So okay. you know, it needs some updating. But I mean, it's certainly fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the house. I didn't yeah, see it's, it's livable. It's not yeah, like. Absolutely. It's not yeah, like a, yeah, it's a good house. 
Okay. No, all right. No, not at all. I mean, I have okay. done deals with those before. Right. We had one house where the, the roof leaked so bad that we had to put on our marketing. If it's raining today, then take your umbrella inside the house. And we actually sold that one with owner financing. So, yeah. And uh, I think that's the key, right? Like, that's the key is like you're, you're selling it with owner financing. But then, okay, so like, how, how are you getting your deal flow? Where, where are the deals coming from? Are they coming from bandit signs and that, that type of thing? Or like, where, where, how do you find these things? Yeah, well, when I started off in 2010, all I did was bandit signs. And I found that in my markets, at least, that the signs work less effectively as they used to, which I'd say that's probably true for all marketing mediums because the market was so bad in 2010. But now all of our lead flow, um, I can't say all, 90% is from Google AdWords. And we just started a cold calling campaign across multiple states to contact pre-foreclosures. So I'm really testing the, the cold calling to see how that's going to work. I don't know exactly yet, but it looks promising. And I think it's going to be something that we're, we're going to want to do long term. But um, yes, to, to answer the question, we have to do real marketing to create the, the lead flow that's necessary to, to buy these high equity deals. All right. And then are you sending somebody out to look at them because you're, you're doing multi-state? Are you, are, you know, like if you're doing multi-state, are you... I mean, I don't think you're going out and looking at them. I mean, do you have teams of people who go out and look at them? Yeah, so my business hub is still Metro Nashville. So most of what we do is still within driving distance. But yeah, we, we've done deals in, I think, 16 states at this point. Um, it looks like we're buying a house. A, a guy called me yesterday, and it's just south of Sacramento, California. And, uh, and it looks like a, a promising deal, a deal that we would do. And so we're, we're kind of all over the place. So to, to answer the question, yes, we have to have – a real idea of value and a real idea of condition. And so we're going to lean on, on local professionals to give us that information. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And so then, then you're not, are you, you're not selling with a realtor then like you're just, you're just doing your ads to find your, your, you know, your buyer. Correct. So when we're selling with owner financing, which again is roughly 70% of my business, then we're going to handle the sale ourselves. Uh, we gotcha. don't list with a realtor. We don't find that it's necessary. Although I do think it would be easier sometimes because we've, we've got like, uh, we can buy still more houses than we can really effectively manage the sale of. It's right. a, which is kind of funny because we've been in a seller's market for a long time, but we can still buy more equity than we can get rid of, you know, which is a great position to be in. But, um, <laughs> right. you know, uh, most of the time we're selling the property ourselves. Yeah. I mean, Mark, that, I mean, that sounds like exactly kind of what we're doing, right? You know, obviously it's a different approach because we're, we're, we're doing direct mail, but I, I mean, like, that's the same problem we have. Like I can buy more, I can buy like unlimited land yeah. and the sellers are there, but like, it's so easy to accumulate this stuff that, yeah. you know, like you're going to sell and you have to have like a full core press to sell and you can do it. The problem is, is that I think you can find the land easier or in Brad's case, the house is easier than you can, can sometimes find the sellers. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the, the buyer pool for owner financing is vast and I don't remember the exact statistics, but I think it was January. It was somewhere around 31% of mortgage applications were denied. Well, you think about that, that's roughly a third of the mortgage applications. So if we think about today's market that every, for every two houses that are selling, another house could have been sold had they been able to get the money that's a big market and there's not many of us playing in it. Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. Mark. Yeah. I love it. But even the issues with, I, mean, I know, I know I'm getting shiny object syndrome, but you know, there are the legal issues that, you know, land is exempt because we're not dealing with a tenant. So do you have to deal with Dodd, Frank, RESPA and the safe act? Yeah. I mean, Dodd, Frank is something that we have to consider. And so the, the short answer on that, uh, for those that don't know, Dodd, Bank is, is a banking regulatory act and part of which was uh, putting the clamp down on owner financing. So we have a limited amount of transactions that we can do per individual without a residential mortgage loan officer approving the transaction. But the short answer is if, if the Dodd-Frank Act is a concern is to not originate. So what we do in a majority of our transactions is we're having our seller before we close, we're going to put our buyer in place and our seller is originating the loan. So the only place that we show up is in an assignment of note or deed, note deed of trust or mortgage. Ah, ah. that's slick. slick. That's, that's slick. slick. Like yeah. that, that's the skirting of it, isn't it? Yeah. And so it's like, well, we don't originate, you know? And so that it's like, there's no, no issue. Uh, the, uh, the second reason that we want to do it that way is we're, we're starting to put a lot of our notes into a Roth. And so, um, 
you know, self-direct the Roth. Well, the seller originates this loan. It. I lost you. You're putting your notes in a, in a self-directed Roth. Okay, yeah. Correct. Yeah, we're putting it into a self-directed Roth. And so with that, if the seller originates this loan, then my Roth can come in and buy that loan at closing. And so you think about what, what is the value of a second behind a first that, that we just pulled from foreclosure with a C or D paper borrower? Well, on the open market, it's worth very little. So we're able to go in and, and buy for pennies on the dollar these notes and throw it into a Roth, which is kind of my, um, my long-term strategy. Wow. I love it. I love it. Scott, the shiny object. Yeah, the yeah I'm just thinking. Well, I mean, I'm you guys could do that with, with the land. You know, you guys are, are creating notes on land. So, I mean, just throw it in the Roth. Yeah, and and I like I'll buy I'll buy land in my in my in my uh, qualified retirement plan. I'll, I'll do that and then sell it. So I'm doing kind of doing the same thing. For us, I don't have to worry about the origination piece. So, you know, it's it's a little bit easier, I think. Right. Uh, right. Not that what you're doing is hard, but you know, essentially, it's just one less step. Sure. Right. Right. Now, what about a foreclosure? I mean, I I just I imagine that hopefully it's a rare event. Like I know for us, we have because we use land contracts. Um, it's not a big deal if someone defaults, but with a right. deed of trust, you would have to pay, you know, an attorney and the foreclosure fees and the time. Is that what, what percent of that occurs? Would you say? And that's a great question. And it's probably one thing that I missed when, on why people don't get involved in notes is they're scared of the, of the foreclosure process. Well, depending on the state, you know, you, if you're in a mortgage state, then certainly the, the foreclosure process is a longer process than, uh, than an eviction. But in deed of trust states, which is most of where I play, uh, it's really not that big of a deal. It's not that much difference. Um, but all of your paper, all is a big word. Let me back up. 90% of your paper is either going to default or pay off in five or six years. Okay. So, um, and I would say roughly 10% of your paper is going to default. I have yet to have a default happen where it wasn't to my financial benefit to take the house because we get real down payments. And we service the loan pretty closely, but also, you know, we've been in a very appreciating market. And so we would re basically recapture, uh, you know, three or four or five years of appreciation at that point. Plus we got a 20 or 25 K down payment on the front end. So it's just double dipping, you know, those kinds of transactions. I don't mind it from a financial perspective. I do mind it from an ethical perspective. I don't want to foreclose on anyone, certainly not a family. But at the same time, you know, we have agreements and, and if they don't pay, then I can't give them the house. And they understand that. And I've never had a, a super um, difficult situation with a, a seller. You know, if someone is getting, I say a seller, uh, a borrower, if someone is getting behind on a payment, you know, we'll do an in-house refinance. We'll put back payments on the back end of the loan uh, to, to get people current if we think that they can at that point afford the, the loan. So, you know, if somebody loses a job or they get sick, then we're going to take those circumstances in, into consideration, but at the same time we're running a business. And so there's, there's kind of a gray area there and a fine line between being, uh, being fair and being a pushover, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would, I'm wondering because, you know, a lot of times people ask me, well, what are the best places to go to buy raw land? And I'm always like, well, it's the Southwest, Northwest California, in Florida, because nobody wakes up and thinks to themselves, boy, I'd like to buy some raw land today in Minnesota, unless you live in Minnesota. <laughs> so right. are there certain states or counties or cities that you would say are ideal for this type of investing over others? Or is it, are you agnostic as far as, you know, the areas? Are you just opportunistic? Yeah. And I guess the it's a really good question. And I think it's, it's a really deep answer that I could really go into, but the high points are, it depends. So uh, of course I would think a little bit differently on a, a transaction in Flint, Michigan right now, because st they still, to my understanding, haven't dealt with the water problem, you know? Um, but if, if a property is in a market of, you know, 15 or 20 plus thousand people, so we have to have population. I really don't want a transaction in the middle of, Littleton, Kansas, if there is such a thing, where there's a population of 150 people. So like, that's something that would kind of turn me off. Um, as far as states, I mean, there are certain states that are a little bit more pro-business than others. I know Washington State has uh, some kind of uh, weird laws about 
uh, investors marketing to pre foreclosure people. I mean, my personal stance is that has to drive the foreclosure rate up because we buy a lot of houses and save a lot of people from foreclosure. But, uh, you know, I guess the short answer is it depends. There's not a deal that I not look at, um, probably outside of Alaska, because we had one come in that was in Alaska. And I was just like, I don't know anything about there. Like I've heard it stays dark there three months a year or something. It's like, I, I just, I don't, I didn't want to take the time to learn about that market to kind of figure that one out. All right. Great. Great. And then as far as managing your notes, I assume you're using a note servicing company. No, we manage in house. You do manage in house. We manage in house. Do you collect automatically via ACH? We don't. And, and I really should. And so basically I'm kind of old school on this and it's just by laziness. You know, when I started, I had a program that, that amortizes everything out and bill statements and 1098s and all that. And so our payments are due on the 10th and the underlying payments are due on the 15th. So we have kind of a five day grace period there, you know, to get the cash in, get it deposited, see who's going to pay or not, put some pressure on them. And then the, the underlying payments are due on the 15th. And um, I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty, uh, I don't know, uh, 19th century when it comes to our, our collection processes, I guess. Man, if there was just some, some platform that would manage no payments, Mark. It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? If there's just some way to automate that. Easily. You oh, get ACH man. Oh, and you do the amortization and have oh, a full, oh, no note setup fees. I wish there was something out there. Yeah. Oh, wait. Today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io. It is the way to automate in a one-time set it and forget it way to automate collecting your notes. If the ACH fails, you can have a credit card on file as a backup. You're definitely going to get paid with certainty. Your borrower can log in. They can make a prepayment at any time. It automates the notifications. It is going to save you so much time. And actually with a note servicing fee, the way that we have a price because there's no note setup fees, it's actually a profit center and doesn't cost you anything check it out. Do the demo at geekpay.io. Also, if you want to learn how to get to the next level in our business, you want to schedule a call with the Zen master Mike Zeno or Scott Bossman at uh, the landgeek.com forward slash training. So Brad, how'd you like that little, uh, sold little setup? Are you sold? Check <laughs> it out. You'll love sold. it. You'll love it. And, um, I'm sure you have tons of notes. I think our, our, the way that we do it is like a buck a note after 99 buck after 99 notes. So yeah, that's certainly it's, agreeable. It's super affordable. Anyways, back to you, right? Okay. I want to do your model. What's the best way to get started? You know, real estate is a, a super wide and a super deep knowledge base. So you have to know a lot about a lot of different things. And so what I would say is uh, this model begins the same way that almost every other model begins, which is through the marketing machine. So we have to have effective marketing to go out and capture motivated seller leads to where we can buy equity. The second thing that we have to understand is how to negotiate from the front door to the contract in a way that's going to allow us to buy on terms. So I'm not a big fan of like, hey, let's pay uh, all cash for houses in, in most circumstances and uh, without some, some form of financing. So, you know, we buy subject to, we buy with true owner financing, usually at 0% rates because of our negotiation that we've kind of set up, that, that structure. And then third, you have to have the, the deal structure in mind while you're going through that negotiation so that you can kind of pave the road for that seller, the direction that you want them to go right? So a lot of it is really starts with the marketing. So if, if someone starts their marketing machine, they have a negotiation structure from front door to contract, and then they learn a lot about deal structure and how to negotiate it, then they can be successful in this. Scott Todd, you ready to partner on this? Mark, I'm ready to roll, man. I'm, I'm like ready to, to like start cruising. Now, could I buy this to a realtor or no? Like the realtors, the, the, the like, no, it's tough to negotiate good deals with a, a third party. You know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that negotiation is best done in person. And it's really best to have a, a framework and a script whenever you do your negotiation. So 
but we, we have all of that that I've kind of come up with across the years, but um, going through realtors is really, really tough. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know what, Scott and I are kind of spoiled now. We're each working about two hours a week in our land business because automated. How many hours a week are you working in your note, your land, your, not your, your house note business? Yeah. And that's a great question. It's so funny because whenever you're in real estate, if you have your iPad and your iPhone, you're technically on call. So, I mean, I'm on call like all the time, but as far as the amount of work, I don't know. It, it, it becomes a gray area on what is work because you know, I'll go to the Mexican restaurant for lunch and, you know, uh, work a little bit, but I'm more just having good, a good time. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say somewhere around 25 hours. Okay. All right. Well, Brad, this has been really enlightening. I'm so glad that you came on to share your wisdom on this incredible model. But as you know, we're going to ask you for, to, for one last piece of wisdom, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Um, this is not exactly real estate related, but um, I've been reading 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. And I think it's just an amazing, amazing book. So, you know, if you're a business person or not, there's so much wisdom and insight in that book that that's where I'm sending people right now. I love that book. That book is like a, like a hard slap in the face every page. There's a lot of depth to that book. It is not the lightest read. No, it's all. not. But it, I think it will withstand the test of time. And there's so much media right now that doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great tip. Scott Todd, are you ready Man. for your tip of the week? How do I stand up against that one? That is a good book, by the way. Uh, all right, Mark, check out this, uh, Chrome plugin that I, uh, have like adopted and love. It's called color Zilla color Zilla. And you can, you can like Google like colorzilla.com, Right. And what it does is, um, basically color Zilla color And basically what it is, is like, it goes, it's a, it's a Chrome plugin. It goes up there in your Chrome browser. And then whenever you want to know like what color something is on a website, like maybe you're trying to do some design or maybe you're trying to match colors or something, you just go and you take the eyedropper, you drop it on the color thing. And then what it does is it takes that color and saves it to your clipboard. You just copy it to your clipboard and then boom, you're off to the races and you have all the, the hex colors that you want. So all of our designers will like that. I like it. Eric Peterson right now is smiling. Maybe, maybe. He probably already knows about it, though. I know. He's probably, maybe he's rolling his eyes right now. Like, really? Yeah. Colors yeah, that's, like, that's so geez, 2012. That's for, years, man. That for years. I like it. I just found yeah. it. I like it. Yeah, I think it's cool, though. Um, I've never heard of it. So, very good. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Brad and his incredible model at bradsmotherman.com. And if you can't sp spell Smotherman, um, don't worry about it because we're going to have a link to the, the page. So learn more, bradsmotherman.com. And um, Brad, are we good? Yeah, I mean, that was fantastic. You guys can also find me on Investor Creator Podcast with Brad. Uh, go through notes and financing and all kinds of fun stuff that uh, my wife doesn't want to hear about anymore. So you're doing her a favor, <laughs> but not... Uh, but not uh, shutting me down. You know, you guys keep listening. I'll keep talking and she won't have to hear it. Hey, that's, that's how my wife feels, I think. And Mark's wife too. Like we, we just might need to like get on this call more often, just talk because. Well, it's such a fun business, you know, and it's a great thing to enjoy what you do. So, I mean, I, I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I love it. It's, it's not, it's not work, is it? No. You love no what you that's do. why I have a tough time work. answering that question. It's like, I don't really know. Right. It's like, uh, define work. Yeah. Um, Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Well, I want to thank all the listeners. And if you're getting value out of these podcasts, do me a favor, put it on social media, send it to a friend. But the most important thing you can do to really help us out is three little things. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com, we're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit for free. So please do that. 
All right, Scott, are you ready? We're ready, Mark. Ready? One, two, three, let freedom, freedom ring. Ring. Brad's like rolling his eyes. Oh, like, really, guys? Boy, I love We it. did really, really good at the last boot camp, though. That's all I got to say. It's way better live. That's all. It I is say. way better live. <laughs> I, I, I like when we're not live that we do it every other word. Yeah, I think so, too. That's what we're yeah, doing. I think, yeah, exactly. We'll change it up next time. Right, because Brad won't come back again. He'll be like, so, he has uh, just too geeky. Right, we'll, we'll get him back. We'll get him back. No, I'm happy all to right. come back. Absolutely. All right, awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see everyone next time.